today um, we will do another installment of how to be an effective witness. This will be the second uh, message on how to be an effective witness and what my intentions are is to, to start sharing with us what it means and how to witness, to whom should we be witness, when should we witness, what should we witness, and just really try to answer those easy elementary questions and just kind of take away some of the fluff and just understand our purpose in witnessing. First thing I want to tell you is that we're in a very critical time in history where we are now coming to a conjunction or to where two ends meet or the crossroads. We are now there. It's no longer coming. We're there. And it's very important which direction you go, which turn you make. And so we have to be sure in ourselves as to where do we turn. Because there's a lot of information out there. Information is heavy. Internet, television, computers, Telephones, information has increased, as the scripture said. And so we have to be careful of what information we believe. And so while we are okay with listening and, and looking and learning, how do we discern what is good and what is bad? How do we understand? I mean, because we're, we're obviously in the period now that the scripture talks about that would be um, where they would say good is bad and bad is good. And so as we now move, start to move along into how to be an effective witness, I will do my best to compile this down into a very simple format of which, before I finish, and I don't think, I, I, well, I won't finish today. I can tell you that already. I was trying to get all the information and condense it down so much that um, there was still a lot of information I didn't get to share for today. I just said, let me just save it for another time, so I will do that. And in the meantime, I will share today a little more information that uh, I think will I think it will um, do well in the area of understanding. And the last point, then I'll start moving. As I move through this, you don't have to try to retain everything I say. Again, I will give you a very simple format. But today, I'm going to give you so far what I'm looking at. And I, I don't know if it will change um, from this point. Or, you know, I select more that I think is even better. But I'm trying to get it down to as low as three major points that you as a witness can even memorize. And you will be able to use it quite effectively in 10 to maybe even 30 seconds, and that's giving you a lot of time. And as I move through, you will understand why I say from 10 to 30 seconds, you will be able to witness quite effectively, and you won't struggle with it, not at all. Let's go. Next. As I did on last week or the last session, 
I want to just go back in history and understand from history what has happened, what has been done, and try to line it up with what is happening, what will be done. So, looking back in history, I want to go back to even the garden where this section is history of deception. Surely you will not die. Now we understand that from the garden which was told to Eve. But the problem is both Eve and Adam died. Now that was a partial truth of course because when he said, surely will not die, he meant today. And he uh, kept out a piece of major information. They didn't know death, in other words. But death happened. And that takes us back about 6,000 years, approximately, back to the garden. And I'm only going back to the time of creation. And how do I come up with that number? You take all of, starting with Adam and his first begat or his first child on record of age, which is Seth, and in that, uh, and uh, uh, Adam was 130 years of age and begat Seth. So we start there. And you just start moving with all of the begats, and you, you, that's a timeline, basically, what I'm saying. And then the tenth generation from Adam was Noah. So the next statement is no rain. This is how Hasatan or Satan once again fooled or tricked the humans or the human race by persuading them that what was taking place, which was warned long before it happened. Matter of fact, for I would say since the seventh generation, the warning came, and that was with uh, Enoch. And so we're going back. We're going back well over seven, eight, eight hundred, nine hundred years or more to get back to Noah. I mean, uh, Enoch. That's when the waters came out. And so we're looking at at least 5,000 years uh, going back. Said it was no rain. It would be no rain. Um, by the tenth generation, for three generations, Yahweh um, really really taught that you should repent and return. 1656, going from Adam, the flood came and only eight people survived. The next, the next great deception was resurrection. During the time of Yeshua, now we're going in uh, 4,000 years from Adam. 4,000 years from Adam. They were deep into the teaching that there would be no resurrection. They didn't believe in the resurrection. You had the Pharisees. You had the scribes. The Pharisees, they believed in the resurrection, but the scribes did not. The Sadducees did not. Other groups did not. There were, you know, different groups by this time that were all fighting over this concept. But Yeshua, not only did he rise from the dead, but he also raised the dead. And we have that testimony in Luke chapter 16. Um, and actually, I'm talking about uh, um, Lazarus. But before I get to him, Luke chapter 16. Here's a rich man. We have a scriptural testimony. Uh, verse 19 through 31. There's a rich man who died and found himself being tortured in the abyss or 
uh, what is called hell or Hades. He awoke and found himself being tortured, and he cried out to Father Abraham, who also was dead, and asked him to send Eliezer, the servant, to dip his finger in water and put it on his tongue. Now, you got to know that if he was in that kind of heat, that it said, the scripture says it was unquenchable fire, heat, hell. It was just torture. And so he was so tortured in this, it pleased him to think that not a glass of water, but just his finger in dipping in water and place it on his tongue, that would be enough to make him comfortable to think that if he can convince him to do that, that would be great. But Abraham told him, we can't get to you, you can't get to us. In other words, there was a separation from where the rich man were and where Eliezer Eli uh, and Abraham were. Um, they were in now comfort. And this is after death. So this is the reason I'm bringing this up. But the rich man who had everything, he found himself in hell being tortured. And he couldn't get, he couldn't get any help with that. Let's move on to the next, which is no longer under the law. Here's another great deception. For at least 2,000 years now, we have been taught that we are no longer under the law based on the resurrection of Yeshua, who also raised Lazarus, who Yeshua said that he was not sleeping the sleep of death. But to you, yes, he is dead. But this was so that the manifestation would be in your presence. So he raised Lazarus, which was the brother of Miriam and Martha. And so that argument whether or not resurrection should take place was very a very heated debate during that time. Now, of course, when he died, when he was crucified, he rose. And many saw him. So, still the great deception. Then the next thing that I want to look at. Now they have moved the Sabbath from its natural place being the seventh day to the first day, which is Sunday, the first day of the week, using the Gregorian calendar. Saturday, being the Sabbath, was hidden for a long time far as whether or not it is the Sabbath, you just say Sabbath, and the day you went, you just thought it was the Sabbath. But now that there are those of us who are waking up are starting to challenge the thought of the Sabbath. So that too is part of the law that is spoken of as we are no longer under the law. Then the next one, there's a new teaching that came out in 1830, which was called, or is called, the rapture. A woman had a dream, and she went to the Catholic priest, um, John Darby. He interpreted and came out with the, the theory of rapture where Christians will be basically raptured from the earth to the clouds when troubles start. The next part, and that's only been, that's only 185 years ago. And so it has taken on very strong root. Now, the reason I'm giving you these numbers because I want you to really be able to analyze analytically going all the way back to the garden, to the newer deceptions. And so from the rapture, there's two other thoughts that comes with that. There's pre-rapture or pre-tribulation, 
and then there's tribulation. So even that has broken into two different camps. There are those who will fight tooth and nail that there's got to be a pre-rapture happening. And that means basically before the judgment of the nations, when Hasatan and his demons are troubling the earth, when evil suppresses the earth, in other words, there will be a pre-rapture of the church. The church would be taken up into the clouds. That's pre-rapture. The tribulation period is during the tribulation, or what is taught as Jacob's troubles. That would be during Jacob's troubles, the church would be taken up into the clouds above the troubles of the earth. And so while those are all still theories, there's one more thing that I want to bring in, which is the emancipation that took place at Passover, 1865. Now recognize the dates, rapture, 1830, Emancipation, 1865. We had no choice. Recognize we had no thoughts, no theory, no nothing to do with anything. As black people, we were not in any of that. We were enslaved. This was a slave-master relationship. You simply did what the master said, or you paid the penalty the master put on you. And let me just say, they were not people of color. And so, to further look at that, as people of color, we came to this nation, as history says, 1619. So from 1619 to the time that we were emancipated, that was 200 and 46 years exact. As of 2015 or 2015, it will be 150 years exact. Now, I call these numbers because inside the numbers there's, there's some codes I see there. That 150, 50, 50, 50, is three jubilees. Every jubilee is 50 years. Is that a coincidence? That there's three jubilees in that 150 year period? Or from the time we were enslaved in this country until the time we were emancipated, being two, 246 years, and if I add those up, two plus Four equals six plus six equals 12. And so with that 12, are we now looking at the 12 tribes once again? That 150, one plus five plus zero equals six. Man, emancipated, slaves, Three jubilees, redemption, let's go to the next. So today, connecting with the garden, what we need to also keep in mind is back in the garden, we know that death took place. Scripture even says that it rained from Adam to Moshe. Very puzzling why he would say to Moshe rather than to Yeshua. But that's because the law itself um, dictated life and death. In the day that you eat from this tree, you shall surely die. That was the law in the garden. And so because man died from the garden, to Moshe, 
or reign, it had authority, in other words. Law came into place, and now that Yahweh gave us the Torah or the law at Mount Sinai, now the Torah is the authority. That if you, li if you live by it, the scripture says, you will live by it. That was the short explanation. I, I just want to kind of keep rolling through and get as much as I can for today. But we're eating, uh, how do you know which tree you're eating from? So that's the question I want to try to answer. How do you know which tree, which tree you are eating from? And there is a way to know. There is a way to know. One tree produces life. The other tree produces what? Death. That's how you know. So we see the example back in the garden, and we're going to track this down by understanding, let's go to the next, the tree of life. Now, the tree of life leads to everlasting life. Let's start with Jeremiah looking at Jeremiah 16, 19. O oh, Yahweh, my strength, my stronghold, and my refuge, in the day of distress, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say to, and say, ends of the earth, and say, our fathers have inherited only on. falsehoods, yeah. lies, right. futilities, and there is no value, no value. in them. Mm -hmm. Zechariah, and these are the two, these are two different prophets. Chapter 12, verse 10. I, I think I would like for y'all to help me read this one. Every place you see yellow, you read. And I shall pour on the house of David. And on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of favor and prayer. And they shall look, look on, on me whom they pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. son. And they shall be in bitterness over him as a bitterness over the firstborn. First There's messages in here that I want you to recognize. First, looking at the, the first... Um, prophet Jeremiah in the days of, of distress there is a place of refuge and we see that place of refuge today as Yeshua but there's a lot of Torah on this of which I'll have to go past for today but we know that Yeshua is our place of refuge in other, in other words if you have sin well let me just go ahead and mention really quick in the Torah if there was a crime committed, whether or not the person is guilty, that's not the case right now. But he says, build a city. First, they started with three cities, then went to six cities, and then finally, 48 cities throughout the kingdom of, of Israel. So that if a, a person commits a crime, they may run to the city of refuge right. and hide there. No one can go into that land and drag them out because they are now safe right. in the city of refuge. That's right. But if he gets caught on the outside right. of the city of refuge, if a relative sees him, and takes his life, there is no judgment against that relative. Because the relative now is the revenger of blood. And so this is why Yahweh built cities, when they built all of their cities, within their cities, there were places of refuge until judgment comes. And so when judgment comes, they must now investigate whether or not the person is guilty. Now, I'll, I'll just move on from there. But our 
fathers, so look at um, Gentiles, our fathers. There's a connection that you know that it has to not really be Gentiles as we would think. No connection to Israel. But it says, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, our fathers. Right. So if the Gentiles are saying, our fathers, they must be really Hebrew. Right. In order to be our fathers. Our fathers who are in the wilderness. Because who is it Yahweh is speaking to? But Israel, and, and that will be proven uh, shortly. But we know that it is Yahweh who's speaking. But there is a place in the time of distress that is hidden. And we can hide ourselves, which is the place of refuge. And then looking at Zechariah, who is speaking when it says, I? I shall pour out a pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Who would you say? Just shout it out. Who is the I in this? Who's speaking? Yahweh. Yahweh. And I. Because who's speaking up top? Yahweh. He named himself. Even though these are two different prophets, Yeshua has not come yet. Okay, so we can pretty much verify that this would be Yahweh. I shall pour in the house of David, and watch this, and on the house, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He put those in two, two different places. Mm -hmm. That means the house of David is not in, in Jerusalem. So in other words, when he says, I'm going to pour out on the house of David, that means wherever they are. But also, I will pour out my spirit on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of favor and a spirit of, of prayer. And they shall look on me whom they pierce. Now who is whom they pierce? Yeshua. Now we have to know that that's Yeshua because Yahweh wasn't pierced. And so what this does is it proves to us that Yahweh and Yeshua the slain lamb are one. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? So we can, we can go along that line and prove that out. But I need to keep moving. But I just wanted you to understand who are we dealing with in these segments here and, and what people and who's speaking. And so when he says, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only what? Son. son. And, and the scripture also tell us the only begotten son, right? right? So we can connect there as well. And they shall be in bitterness as him, as over him, as a bitterness over the firstborn. What was Yeshua? He was the firstborn. He was also the first fruit of him that died and rose. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of connections, but I want to move on from here because uh, we, we're going to keep track of this tree of life and, and the characters. Let's go to the next. So here's now my witness. And I pretty much can, I can guarantee you this. That as I bring this out, you will be able to answer this. Because I'm going to ask you some questions. A statement followed by two questions. And this is what you can use as a, an effective witness that as I finish this, I will always come back to this unless I find something else that grabs me even more. The Rakadesh uh, uh, leads me in a different way. But for now, what I want you to do, I'm going to read this out and I want you to answer it. So I want you to get ready to respond. Who is the bread of life? Yeshua. Yeshua. Very good. Finish this statement. Thank you. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. There is a way. But the end thereof is death. Now, if that took you just a few seconds to answer, I only gave, I, like I said, 10 to 30 seconds, you'll be able to answer that. 
And I guarantee you, traditional teachers, church, will be able to answer this even quicker. Because if you just give it to them, and I took time to explain, if you just give it to them, they'll, they'll, they'll respond right away. Because this is how we've been taught scripture repeated. It's not that they've studied it and read it all, you know, and, and they know everything verbatim. But they can quote what they've heard over and over and over. So let's try it again, and, and I'll just move through it this time. Who is the bread of life? You sure? If you love me, you keep my commandments. There is a way that seems right to a man. But the end thereof is death. This is how we're going to locate and identify the tree by its fruit. So here's my three main points. And I may have it in here one more time, and I may not, but just understand. Here's my premise. This is the effective witness. What I've been given is all of the details and the background that leads to this. So now I will continue with the information. So let's search for our tree the way that seems right. Because it, to me, this is, a good, this is a good premise to start searching for what tree you're eating from. Because the scripture tells us that it is a way that seems right. It also tells us it leads to death. And so by, by deduction, I surmise that if this way seems right, it must lead me to death. And it must be the tree of knowledge. And so if it's the tree of good and evil, then I know that it's going to lead me to death. Why should I repeat what our parents repeated, what they did in the garden? And so our job now is to figure out, before we die, what tree are we eating from? So as we're looking at our three premises or our three categories, let's, let's look here at the bread of life. John chapter 6 verses 48 through 51. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of the heaven. So that anyone might eat of it and not die. Now I will tell you that this is now the testimony of Yeshua. This is Yochanan, John, and he is giving us an inside and in-depth look at the bread of life. Yeshua is speaking and he's now talking to them about the bread that came out of heaven. Our fathers ate the bread in the wilderness. They're no longer here. They died. But you as the seed are here. The next bullet says, and this still goes with John uh, chapter 6. I am the living bread which came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And indeed, the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Very important here. He's making a distinction. But he also drew their knowledge of their forefathers coming out of Egypt, eating bread in the wilderness, needing natural substance. But Yahweh rained down a miracle because he gave them manna or bread out of heaven to sustain them. Because you had over six million people. 
people with no food in the wilderness or the desert. You know you got both hot and cold temperatures. And food is very sparse in the wilderness. And you got over six million men, women, and children. How are you going to feed all them, Moses? So Yahweh gave them bread in the wilderness. Hallelujah. But it was bread for a day. And he even gave them the law that six days you can pick this up. But on the Sabbath, if you guard my Sabbath, on the sixth day, I will give you twice as much on the sixth day. So that when the sixth day, the seventh day come, you would have more than enough. And the eighth day, I will give you until the eighth day, and I will give you more than enough to get past the Sabbath. And so they even tried him in the wilderness. Some went out and picked up sticks and different things and picked up matter, and some picked up more matter. Only enough for a day. Some picked up more, you know, picked up for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But the lesson was depend on Yahweh. That's right, every day. Every day I'm going to give you for six days. Right. So don't pick up any for tomorrow. That's right. Only for today. Pick up enough matter for your family today. Tomorrow I'm going to give you more. So when they got to the sixth day, and some of them went out the next day on the Sabbath, for those who picked up uh, 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 um, on the Sabbath, or more than one day throughout the week, when they opened it up, it stank. It bred, bred worms. And so when the sixth day came, they still, they, they had enough for eight days. And so the lesson was keep the Sabbath. And so here's what he's drawing their attention back to. He's not going through everything I just went through. I just wanted to bring you up to date on the, the background information that was going on in there. But he's saying, now, I am the living bread. Yes. The living bread that came out of heaven. Hallelujah. And so your fathers ate the bread and they died. But now I'm the living bread. And if you eat of this bread, you shall not die. And it actually he says, and he shall live forever. Now here's the problem. When we go to funerals, we see our families die. Where is the forever part? And so right in there is where our belief is challenged. And, and they were challenged because also remember that resurrection has to be trapped in this. And remember that they all did not believe in the resurrection. But now he's bringing them a word before he dies, he's gonna let this be known. I am the resurrection and watch me live again. Right. And those who believe in me shall live and never die. Even though they go to the grave, just like he raised up, you will be raised up. And so he's trying to get us to a greater thought, a greater understanding when he tells us. And so here we are. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. But Yeshua answered, him saying, it has been written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of Elohim. Hallelujah. So what is he saying now? And so you'll find this in both Luke 4.4 4 and Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, where he's saying that man shall not live by bread alone, but he just told us he was the bread of life. Yes, yeah, that's right. So if he's the bread of life, he's telling you, you shall let not live by the Messiah alone. Come on. But every word that comes out of the mouth of Yahweh. That's right. And so while we, in our trying to understand, live forever, the enemy is working on our intellect and trying to make us doubt that we will live forever. So in other words, don't be afraid of death. Death has no authority over you that Yahweh, Yeshua, does not allow. 
Yes, we must die now because of sin. But only once. But then we are raised again. And so, now we must show what we believe by what we do. And the evidence will be by which tree we eat from. Hallelujah. And so, Deuteronomy will also show us that Yeshua is really quoting the Torah. So Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3, And he humbled you, and let you suffer hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, to make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. Yes. He was only quoting the Torah. That's right. And so this is what they got out of our hands when they told us that we were no longer out under the law. Now, we were enslaved when they was teaching that stuff. Right. But notice what, what is going on here. Yeshua is bringing us right back to the Torah. Mm -hmm. Because that's what Yahweh spoke, the Torah. So once again, man does not live by bread alone. Man does not live by Yeshua alone. Man does not live by Jesus alone. But every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. Next. Right, right. So, if you love me, keep my commandment, right? We know that that's what Yeshua says. And so, there's an action that takes place with that. So, let's, let's kind of look into that. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, you shall guard my commands. Here's a question. How does Yeshua define love? How do we guard his commandments? What commandments does he have? Now we know in Exodus that Yahweh gave us the commandments. Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, which is really what they call the law, and they just didn't say we're no longer under the commandments. They said we're no longer under the law. So they changed the name so you don't recognize the principles. Because if they had said we're no longer under God's commandments, they, they would never have gotten them out of our hands. Remember, we're talking about deception, which is half truth. And so 1 John says, chapter 3, verse 18, My little children, let us not love in words or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So let's, let's follow up this with defining, and I went, of course, to Wikipedia, and it says it's a noun, and also, if it's an action, it's a, it's, there's a verb there for all my students. Some, something that is done, an act or action. The act of performing action, righteous, in word and in deed. So what's the principle we're looking at here? If you love me, do what? So, in order to prove that you love Yeshua, in order to prove that you love Jesus, you got to keep the commandments. That means you got to do something. There's some deeds that must be followed in order to prove your love. Who gets to define it? How we prove our love. You cannot do it with just your words. Yes, I love him. And you don't keep, the, keep his commands? This is what he said. If you love me, then keep my commandments. If you love me, show it to me. If you love me, do what it is commanded of you. So it's something that we got to do. Next. Also, the bread of life. Luke, looking at verse 4 again, but Yeshua answered and said, saying, 
It has been written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of Elohim. Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 8, verse 1. Guard to do every command which I command you today, that you might live. I think I need to pause there for a second. Mm -hmm. If you do the commands, what will it cause you to do? Live. Live. All right. We, we, we good there. And, so it doesn't stop, shall increase and go in and shall possess the land of which Yahweh swore to your fathers. There we go. Back to the fathers again. Right. Verse 2, and you shall remember that Yahweh, your Elohim, led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to what? Humble you, Humble. to reprove, to prove you, Thank you Father. to know what is in your heart, whether you guard his commands or not. And he humbled you and let you suffer hunger and fed you with what? Man. Which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, right. to make you know that man does not live by bread alone. Altogether? Man does not live by bread alone. But every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. So if this is that, that simple or that easy to understand, let me show you how we got off track and where we got off track here. When he says, guard to do every command so that you might live, guess what we've been doing? We've been dying, right? right. Okay, so we, that kind of tells you which tree we've been eating from. So, that you should live and shall increase. Go into the land, possess the land, that Yahweh swore to your fathers. And we know who's being talked to by whom here, but I'll just go ahead and tell you. This is Moshe talking. He's talking to Israel, and Israel, the second generation, because the first generation, remember um, Yahweh killed all of them off from the age of 20 and above, did not make it into the promised land. So now, here's the second generation who Moshe is speaking to and making sure that they understand before you go into the land, understand what he did, why he did. He allowed you to suffer in the wilderness, but he also fed you for 40 years. Neither did your clothes wear out. And when he fed you in the wilderness with manna, you didn't even know what it was. But it was the bread that rained down from heaven. And so what I need for you to do is understand that if you stop keeping the commands, because that's the first thing, God to do. Now, I know the King James says, keep the commandments. But that's like, you know, you know, I can keep it in my pocket or keep it in my, keep it under my hat. Or, uh, but I think it's something else when it tells me to guard it. Because when it says guard it, that denotes something like somebody's going to try to get it. So I must guard, guard it. Guard to do. Guard it because someone may try to steal it. And if I'm just trying to keep it, you know, it, it doesn't give me the, the oomph I really need. But to God, it tells me keeping the commandments is doing more than just lip service. So I must do this, and it gives me life, like the bread sustained our fathers in the wilderness. Next. So, let's continue now to try to decipher which tree we're eating from. And I think that if we refer back to the tree now, um, I think this will help us. So what I did is I, I, I went to Deeds and Truth and I reversed it. So my first one says, not done. 
you know, um, when he tells us to guard the commands, to do the commands. So this is what I'm referring to when it says, not done, do nothing, do not perform what you should perform. And the truth, I, I reversed it. The opposite of truth is what? A lie. Or even a half truth. And also we got the, uh, de uh, being deceived. And so, in order to understand what we need to do, I like to look at everything. And so that's why I'm willing to hear someone out. You know, they come to me with something, you know, um, I don't believe what you believe, but here's what I believe. I'll hear you out. That's just the way I am. I'm grounded in what I believe well enough that I can listen to someone else and not be afraid. But now, if you're not grounded enough, if you don't know enough, I would caution you. Be careful. Because what seems true, what seems true, is not true. It only seems true. There's a way that seems right. Next. That's right. So now let's do the same thing with being right or righteous. I have a problem with this word righteous because what it, what is done in traditional uh, thinking is it, it, it's made us it's distorted what righteousness really is. You know, some think righteousness is running around the church holding your back and, and, and shouting and, and, and rolling on the floor and, and uh, being able to do all of these things so you appear righteous because you must have the Holy Ghost. And so all of our life, as we were taught this, and this is not this is not bashing any one religion. What I'm talking about is I want to I want to look at this because this is what I this is how I was brought up. I was brought up in holiness, where you know the music play and and you must show sign. This is what we were taught. You must show a sign of the Holy Spirit within you, and they didn't call it the Holy Spirit. They said the Holy Ghost. And this defines you as righteous. And so while I'm using um, gloves with this, while I touch, you know, on, you know, somebody's sacred cow, uh, I know that I need to be careful of how I address this. So righteousness is what I'm looking for. Righteousness is only really right. The root word of righteousness Take away the uh, 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 right or the this part. Now, what is that? The prefix? Suffix. Take away your suffix. And it's right. What is right? What we're looking for. The tree of life definitely was right. Because had they eaten from the tree of life, they would have lived. And that's why Yahweh gave them the more access to the tree of life. So... We were supposed to be obedient. There's truth, honesty, and light. All of these things you will find in right. But the opposite of right is wrong. The wrong tree for them was the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge was good and bad. Good and evil. That was the wrong tree to eat from. But it seemed right. And so what comes from that is disobedience because they were told what? Not to eat from the tree of knowledge. They wasn't told to eat from, um, not to eat from the tree of life. Guess what? They could have. That's right. right. Up until they ate from the tree of knowledge. knowledge. Once they ate from the tree of knowledge, they were cut off. That's right. Our parents back in the garden. Adam and Eve. So disobedience, lie, half-truth, and darkness. So these are all of the things that we can definitely find under wrong. Next. So to analyze and further go into it, a way that seems right 
ends with destruction. This is our instructions. This is what the scripture already says. Now notice that all the way through history, everything I gave you in the history of deception, that Yahweh gave us his instructions. But Satan, half the time, came back and used the instruction, but he modified it. Okay, so let's kind of start on our way to take a look. Let's find the way that seems right, and here we'll begin with using the first process of elimination. I categorize the whole world here, polytheism or monotheism, many gods or one god. And so while we're analyzing all of the, world, the, the cultures of the world, they all can fit into one of two, or one of these two, whether they have many gods, polytheism, or one god, one god, uh, monotheism. So right away, we can see where the first commandment tells us, you shall have no other gods. And then the third one tells us even no images. And so with that, with that as a blank, guess what those who serve many gods are able to do? Make an image and show you, here's our God. Yes. We're here to witness to you that this is our God. When you see him, this is how he look. With blonde hair, blue eyes. <laughs> Sorry. Right. So... Polytheism, again, it has multiple deities and monotheism, one God. Next. Looking at the world religion or um, looking at the different gods, in religious belief, a deity or in a deity is a supreme being who may be thought of as holy, divine, or sacred. Some religions have one supreme deity while others have multiple deities of variation of various ranks. Here's what Scott Little, um, and again this goes back to um, online and I think it's Wikipedia or one of my other searches. But anyway, Scott Littleton in his book of gods, goddesses, and myths define a deity as a being with powers greater than those of ordinary humans, but who interacts with humans positively or negatively in ways that carry humans to new levels of consciousness beyond the grounded preoccupations. In other words, these deities can interact with human beings and take you to higher heights. Next. So again, how do we know which tree that we're eating from? If it produces life, it has to be the tree of life. But if it produces death, it has to be the tree of knowledge because a tree is known by what? It's fruit. Next. Looking at polytheism, um, and this is just a minute, I mean when I say minute, example, I just needed to go more than one. But to put all of them, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fit in this, <laughs> it wouldn't fit in this teaching. Because there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of gods between the different cultures. And what I'm, what I'm looking at, I'm surveying all of the world at this time, all of the world, okay? Because as we, um, as I taught the last teaching, the deception of Satan, the scripture says that he's deceived the whole world. Right. And so we have to qualify that. What does he mean by the whole world? And so, on the literal level, we have to just look at it. We can't take ourselves and put us above everyone else. 
Just keep it right there. Just leave it. He says the whole world. And so now we too must figure out what tree are we eating from? Will it produce life or will it produce death? So just leave it there. Don't, don't you know, we, we can't put ourselves up above everyone when we get to that, that where he says he has deceived the whole world. Yeah. Leave it right there. Right. That's and let's true. figure out what tree, because we have one lifetime to do this. One lifetime. Adam had 930 years. But in all of that, all I've ever seen that he said one time. Now compare that to you and I. That's mm. right. I know I've said more than once. That's true. And I don't even want to start on how many times I can tell you. But I'm going to tell you this, that all have sinned and fallen short. No. So with polytheism, you got Hindu, Buddhism, um, Hindu, there's something very special here I want you to see. There's a trinity in Hinduism. Yes. Ah. Yes. Shiva, Vishnu, and Brahma. Mm -hmm. That is their trinity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'll come up again. And so there's some more. And then, um, oh, there's Wicca I wanted to bring in here. Wicca, witches. They worship Satan. He's a god. Even the scripture says he's a god. It says he's the, the God of this world. He's the father of lies. Remember, the scripture says he deceived the whole world. And so I got Egypt, Babylon, Rome, and Greek. And so a lot of these are different places, but I wanted to, to focus a little on these last um, areas where Israel experienced their gods. So each of these places were um, where Israel found themselves enslaved and under their deities, so to speak, or the land was under their deities. Next. Monotheism. So we have, I have six different ways or six different um, systems or people, uh, cultures that, that I found in monotheism. And there's actually a couple more that I didn't put on here, but I've never heard of them. And so here's the majority, which is Messianic Hebrews, Christianity, Islam, Rastafarian, Judaism, Jehovah Witnesses. And while I think I have another, I, I think I have another slide that would help understand this a little bit better. Um, if I don't, I'll come back. But while we're here, one of these has to be a way that seems right. Because, how do I come to that conclusion? We know that Yahweh says, you shall have no other God. So that's the first, first thing that we must hold on to in the covenant in Mount Sinai. If it has more than one God, go past it. So that's why I just mentioned all the polytheism. Just skip right on past it because we don't need to look there. Because there has to be a way that seems right. They don't even seem right. When you got gods, you know, just all of this stuff without having to go into all the, the different things. You, you know what I'm talking about on multiple gods. Let's go to the next slide. So this way that seems right has to have cultural appeal, meaning it has to be accepted to multicultures or many different cultures or many different people. It has to be accepted. 
And so, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. <clears throat> the enemy leads the whole world astray. And what I have here, which you may not be able to see, I'm kind of going back in history. It is the Hebrews is first my first focus. But it says Messianic Hebrews. I intentionally faded it out because they wasn't seen during the time of Yeshua and prior to Yeshua. The Messianic only came out when Yeshua was born, when the Messiah was born, uh, Jesus was born. When he was born, he ushered in the Messianic area, yeah, yeah. era. That's right. That's right. Okay. Right. So, but the Hebrews go all the way back to a man called Eber, who is the bloodline of Noah, and he is the bloodline of Shem, or shall I say, Melchizedek? Okay, king of righteousness. So he's the bloodline of the king of righteousness, or the yes. And so Eber, also Abraham, who is, yes, Abraham, who is the bloodline of, of, of uh, Melchizedek, because we see him in the scriptures paying a tie to Melchizedek, right? Mm -hmm. So we can, we can tie that in and verify that. So no problem there. But... That's your, your Hebrews, and Abraham is called Hebrew. Now, how did that happen before Mount Sinai? Hmm. Because the Hebrews were not visible to the earth until Mount Sinai, but they really were. And so that's why I have Messianic faded out for just a moment here. And so now then we go to the next um, religion, and actually... I can see where when I changed some things around, it didn't. I messed up a little bit. So let me go here to Christianity. Christianity, approximately 2.4 billion today. I'm going to kind of, you know, as I'm searching, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at character. I'm looking at timeline. I'm looking at who has a large following. So. I'm, I'm a little bit scattered here because I don't have a lot of room. I didn't want to make it too small to get information in there, and I didn't want to keep stretching it out. So I'm just going to speak it to you. Um, Christianity is large. 2.4 billion people in the earth claim Christianity, which is one-third of the earth's population. And so Christianity comes out of the Hebrews. It is their root. As a matter of fact, all of them come out of the Hebrews. Okay? So they're all out of the Hebrews. That's why I faded some of them. You, some of these you cannot see because I faded them back for that very reason because I wanted to, to, to focus more on where they started, where they are today. So now Islam, they started, uh, they have today about 1.6 billion followers or 23% of the Earth's population, okay? Islam also came out of the Hebrews and the reason they came out of the Hebrews is a result of the Christians branching off. Okay, more about that in a little bit. We have here Rastafarians. Um, that goes back to about the 1930s. And who the Rastafarians are, now again, I'm focusing on religions of the world that have only one God. And I have them all listed except for two, which I've never really heard about. Um, and so the 1930s, 
we're, we're talking less than 100 years ago. So the Rastafarians, though, they have a deeper history. Their history goes back to the Hebrews, and today, from, from their inception, they always knew who they were, but their focus was on the Ethiopian Hebrews. And they, um, from the information that I found, worship Halle Selassie, who was the first, uh, Halle Selassie the first, who was the last emperor of, of Jamaica. Now, when they fought for their independence, they went back to their belief, which was as Hebrews. Now, Halle Selassie is a descendant of the king Solomon. Or in other words, he is a descendant of, and I'll, I'll get to the questions, but he is descendant of um, King David. Now remember, the scripture says that I will restore the, uh, the house of David, right? Well, the Ethiopians um, are the bloodline of King David. And so when they fought for independence, they went against the Europeans and all the different ones, and those who hid up in the mountains, they, um, they, they did like guerrilla warfare. But that's how they live. They came out with this culture of um, Rastarian or Rasta. Uh, actually, well, I won't say it like that because there's, there's a way that people call them, but the Rastas do not, they, they, it's negative for them, so I won't even say it. But um, for lack of how, how to say this, but Rastarian. Um, this was a movement that went back in the 1930s. And then so we have um, Judaism and finding Judaism, which is here, which comes out of the Hebrews as well. The Karzai, they go back to 650 through 850, which is actually who we see in Jerusalem today. They are who we look at as the Jews. They are European, and they come from um, closer to the Black Sea, the Scandinavian countries, um, up above Germany, um, to the northeast of Germany. Whereas their whole community, they were very strong for about 300 years. They took their whole community and converted to Judaism. They called into the rabbis and they said, teach us the language and the culture. So as a nation, they went to Hebrewism. They taught the language, the culture, even, even their dietary laws, they totally changed. And this was by way of the king. And, and I will say this, and I'll probably have this on my next teaching, not by power, nor by might. So they were converted by power. Yes. Okay? Yes. So that kind of exited them out as well. All right, so Jehovah, or Yahweh, Jehovah, Jehovah's Witness, um, 1870s out of the United States, and they've built up a, a large following as well. But they're not strong enough to replace any of these. And so our search must start narrowing down to who we see as the strongest cultures. So let's go to our next one. So remember, Christianity looks like it's one of the largest, strongest cultures. Now keep in mind, Satan, he deceives the whole world. If you love me, guard my commandments. Again, let's look for whether it produces life 
or death in order to know what tree we're going to eat from or we're eating from. And so here's our criteria. The Ten Words or the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. I am Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Misraim, out of the house of slavery. That should, that should catch our attention right there. Slavery has to have something to do with it. Verse 3 through 17 you shall have no other God. And I did modify to, to get this all in here so you won't see the entire commandments. But you shall have no other God. Do not uh, carve an uh, image. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, your Elohim, he, he letting us know who it is, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. You do not bring the name of Yahweh Elohim to not remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. Respect your father and your mother. You do not murder. You do not commit adultery. You do not steal. You do not bear false witness against your neighbor. You do not covet your neighbor's house. And as you continue to read anything, we don't covet. So in looking at this, carved images. Yes. Any culture that builds, and we're talking about idolatry, yes. any culture that worships wood and stone yes. um, make images of their God is suspect. Now, we don't know yet who it is. We may not know who it is. Because we have to stay with the premise. He's deceived the whole world. Yes. But what is factual? Does it produce life or death? That's the key. That's what we're looking for. And so here, it says no image. So that's one thing we look for. No other God, that's another thing. If it has more than one God, then you can just skip on past that, that culture. Bowing down to it. And so while there's things that people bow down to and worship in deception without knowing that they're worshiping it, so I think if we kind of keep that in our thoughts here for a moment, we'll, we'll figure this out next. Tree of life, the tree of knowledge, and here's another tree, evergreen tree that has a God connected to it, the God Odin, which is a German God. Here's the same trick over again. He just changed the name. Now, again, we're looking for one of two trees, the tree of life, which produces life, the tree of knowledge, which of good and evil, it produces death. So if this tree produces death, here we have an evergreen tree that once a year people, well, let me, just, let, 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 let me just go ahead and read this. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So we're going to, like a good uh, PI or what do you call them when they... What is it when uh, P, uh, not public? Private investigator. Private investigator. Yeah, yeah. So like a good investigator, we're going to really take this apart and see where the tree of death is by its evidence of death. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1. Hear the word which Yahweh speaks to you, O house of Israel. Now who's speaking? Let's read it again. Hear the word which Yahweh speaks to you. Who's speaking? Yahweh. Who is he speaking to? Oh, house of Israel. House of Israel. Thus saith Yahweh, do not learn the ways of the Gentiles, and do not be awed by the signs of heaven. 
for the prescribed customs of these people are worthless. Mm -hmm. For one cuts down a tree from the forest, work for the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it does not topple. All right. yes. Now, we can pretty much say what that tree is, but for, for investigative purposes, I'm just going to keep acting like I don't even know. <laughs> I'm just going to keep following up the information and trying to figure this out. But I will tell you, it's an evergreen tree. That's, That's right. So, in order to figure out what tree it is, again, does it produce life or does it produce death? Yeah. The tree of life is everlasting life. I see that as Yeshua in the garden. I believe he was the tree of life. There's also the tree of knowledge, which was also in the garden of which our parents ate from, I see this one as Hasatan, Satan. And I see this because it produced death. And we know that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? right. And so there's this tree today that we are dealing with called this evergreen tree but it's disguised as an eternal tree yeah. by the very nature of its name. Ever green. So there's something deceptive about this tree that makes one think that as you bow down to it with your gift in hand and put your gift under the tree yeah. that it's all about the birth. But its real intent was cut the tree down at a certain time of year, December. You bring it into your home and the guard Odin is flying around inspecting your homes and neighborhoods to see whether you were bad or good. And if you were bad and caught outside your home, he would curse you. But if you were good, he would come into your home and leave you some presents. And so while he, and I think I just kind of added a little bit there, but um, I just went with it. <laughs> but the intent of the God Olden was if you were good or bad, and if you were caught outside, he would bring a curse on you. But what you can do is take this evergreen tree in your home, and it will protect you from the curse of the god Odin. This tree was not um, accepted in the United States until 1848, when the Queen of England and her family took a picture. Her husband was a sun god worshiper. Once they brought it into their home, observing this ritual. Um, they took a picture, and throughout the England provinces, and as well in the United States by 1896, yes, 1896, it was now received because the queen and the aristocrats were seen this was class. This is how you look rich and live well, according to the queen. And so this is why the evergreen was now accepted 
in the United States. But previous to that, it was against the law to even say Merry Christmas. That's right. Oh. You would get fined and put in jail. Oh and so now what they had to do is take away the uh, fine. They had to take away all of the negativity to it. Um, and build around it so that Christians would receive it and go throughout the world to be continued. Can we give Yahweh a praise? Yeah. Yeah. I'm grateful, so grateful for all the Lord has done in my life, for seeing me faithful, for changing my heart and making everything right.